A very warm good afternoon to everyone uh, from Azim Premji University. My name is Shashwat DC, and I'm part of the communication team at Azim Premji University. I welcome you all to this very interesting and engaging discussion uh, for our Rivers of Life Festival. Uh, this festival, which has been running at our campus uh, from November 2nd to November 16th, is a is a complete medley of different you know aspects related to river we have a very interesting photo exhibition going on we have these interesting talks which are going on we are screening a lot of new movies we have a lot of you know uh, musicians and all the people who are associated you know who live nearby the river and they're coming and you know showcasing their their work uh, their music and in addition to that, we have this very, uh, you know, interesting panel of discussion that is going on with different set of, uh, you know, people who are associated uh, with the rivers in terms of, you know, studying them, uh, in terms of conservation, in terms of, you know, practitioners, in terms of authors. So today's, uh, you know, uh, today's session that we are talking about is broadly, uh, you know, we are limiting ourselves to one of the most important rivers that is mentioned in India. Ganga. Uh, the talk today will be centered around discussing various aspects of Ganga, right from the upstream, where we talk about, you know, how the, the river emerges from the mountains, to talk about largely uh, how the river as it courses along the whole, you know, the whole Gangetic plain, as we know, and then finally, as it, you know, passes through uh, the state of Bihar and, you know, merges around with the Bay of Bengal. So this Discussion today, it brings together a very diverse group of river conservation, conservationists and practitioners to, you know, discuss various issues. We have uh, Dr. Jayanta Bandhapadhyay who will explain the miracle that sustains millions. This is the water tower of Asia, which is there in the Hindu Kush uh, mountains. We have Anthony Achiawati who will speak in detail about his experiences documenting and writing about the river. And finally, a talk by, you know, uh, Eklave Prasad uh, talking about the phenomena of floods, in, especially in northern uh, Bihar. Just before we dive into this discussion, I just wanted to, you know, give a little bit of overview about the importance that Ganga has in our society. We, of course, uh, from a religious, cultural aspect, uh, everyone knows uh, how important Ganga is, but also from a pure play, uh, you know, aspect of sustaining lives, uh, you know, uh, the river flows to almost 2,500 kilometers across the landscape of India and Bangladesh. It's its third largest river in terms by discharge. And, you know, it's also the largest. It, it sustains the highest population of any river basin in the world. It, it also, you know, kind of the, the mouth of the river Ganga as it empties into West Bengal and Bangladesh. It's the largest known uh, delta known as the Sundarbans and, you know, it has also been declared a uh, World Heritage Site. It sustains a lot of uh, biodiversity in terms of, you know, species uh, uh, and different animals and who live on the side of the banks and everything. Uh, and there are different aspects that are there in terms of, you know, the uh, focal point that it traverses through. In addition to all that, uh, Ganga is also uh, highly polluted. There are different uh, aspects that come into it. It's, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, pollution in terms of sewage and everything that flows into the river. There have been numerous efforts made over the past many decades in time to, you know, uh, cleaning up the Ganga per se. So there, there are a whole gamut of things uh, that are, that are you know, related to this river. Uh, while, let me be honest, uh, it won't, it's not a possibility that we can, you know, a discussion on Ganga truly would require, you know, days, if not, uh, you know, weeks to get into depth of a topic like that. Uh, we will, we will, you know, confine ourselves to a very interesting uh, discussion and deliberation with our aspects, uh, touching upon various important themes which are related to the kind of work that uh, they have done over the years. So without much ado, let me, you know, first, uh, the format that we'll have is we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a presentation by each of the, you know, uh, uh, the panelists that we have today, followed by a brief Q&A, uh, and then we'll move on to this thing. Uh, my request to all uh, viewers, uh, who are joining us uh, virtually on our YouTube channel and also from 
the seminar hall that you know they might be joining in and watching it on the big screen out there you can type in your questions and your comments on the live chat box and possibly we'll take them up uh, through the course of the discussion that we have you know with that uh, let me just uh, start off first by inviting uh, dr jayanta badhapadhyay before i get into him i'll just give a brief uh, profile of his uh, dr jayanta badhapadhyay is a researcher analyst and author he is also a distinguished fellow at the observer research foundation kolkata he is a former professor of the indian institute of management at calcutta he received his phd in engineering from iit kanpur in 1975 He is also an internationally known professional in public interest research on mountain environment and water governance in South Asia, and has authored more than sixteen critically acclaimed books and monographs. In addition to a lot of papers and articles that he's done. So, with that, uh, uh, I hand over the you know the stage to you, uh, Chandra. So, if you can you know take us through your interesting presentation. Thank you. A very good afternoon. Uh, thanks to sashwat thanks to uh, all my uh, uh, colleagues at the azim prem ji university who have shown interest in general on the issue of the rivers of life and uh, in particular i was told that a document that was published Uh, by myself and my co-author modak on the water tower of asia actually uh, was one of the factors that this session was uh, designed so i'm i'm for any author to get uh, to know that uh, what you have written is uh, getting multiplied in such uh, Uh, organizations like the Azim Prem Ji University, it's a matter of uh, satisfaction and pride. So I am also thankful to my colleagues there for being kind enough to take note of that document and also to invite me to speak today. I I have a dual task. i was uh, first given the task of talking about the larger himalayan river system not starting only with ganga and i'm sure my other uh, two colleagues will talk about details in ganga but uh, uh, it will be probably a good background to understand the hindu kush himalaya as a very large source of water for asia and the source of uh, 10 major rivers of asia and then seeing ganga as one of them so i will uh, take my talk to introduce the 10 large rivers and then come to the issue of ganga so may i request the slide to be put up which uh, says that the hindu kush himalaya as the source of 10 major rivers of life in asia uh, this is a photograph uh, from the brahmaputra where uh, it takes a sharp u turn and uh, emerges from the tibetan uh, plateau slowly into the indian plain this is particular location for the photograph now i go to the main thing what i wanted to say is the crucial role of the hindu kush himalaya as the water tower of asia and water and food security of more than 2 billion people if we have a global population of about 7 uh, roughly one third of the world population uh, depends on for water and food on the hindu kush himalaya and that is the scale at which we are working no other uh, water system or uh, mountain system has this great use 
of uh, providing water and food security. Now, water from the Hindu Kush Himalaya is distributed over a large area in Asia as the 10 rivers of life flow in 16 Asian countries. 16 Asian countries is not a matter of joke. And the impacts of global warming and climate change, it is uh, uh, a, a great matter of concern for all of us that Himalaya is warming at a rate three times higher than the rate in which the global average is taken. COP27 is starting or may have started already. And uh, it, it is interesting to see that the average that COP27 takes up is only one third of the temperature rise we find in the Himalaya. And that affects the whole water system on which more than 2 billion people uh, depend. Now I go to the next slide, which is the global water crisis. Everyone knows there is a global water crisis and that water governance is globally facing a deep conceptual crisis. And it has been stressed in the last many decades, probably more than 100 years now, that uh, le leading to calls for the practice of integrated water resource management which is widely known by the word IWRM. Now, the problem starts here. Uh, IWRM has been mentioned as a need, but uh, very little has been done, very little has been achieved, very little progress has been made to make IWRM a usable tool for water governance. IWRM has remained an abstract idea, and that is our problem. Now, coming to the question of our uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan water, Hindu Kush Himalaya extracts a very large volume of water. And I, I must say that mountains do not produce water. They only extract the water from atmospheric circulations. Uh, poets, sculptures, or painters have always shown us that mountains produce water. Mountains, ecologists have shown us that mountains do not produce water. They just access the water which is in the moving atmospheric circulations. If we did not have the Himalaya, the monsoon would have entered Central Asia and far into Europe. It is the Himalaya which extracts the water from the monsoon and creates our life-giving rivers. Next slide, please. Now, what is Himalaya? Uh, Himalaya is many things for many people, but uh, geologically, Himalaya is an area which is affected by the uh, plate tectonic collision of the Eurasian or Tibetan plate and the Indian plate. And not only the Indian Himalaya that we see is part of the geological process, but whole Tibetan area, Tibetan plateau, uh, is also uplifted as a result. So here we see Himalaya as a very large area, white area, and uh, is full of 
uh, ice and snow. And this is our saving grace for the 10 rivers. Now let me go to the next one. How does the Himalaya create these rivers? As I said that Himalaya doesn't produce water. It only extracts from atmospheric circulations. The most important is the our uh, southwest monsoon starting from May, ending in October. Uh, and also for the east uh, eastern part of Asia, we have the East Asian summer monsoon, which you see in pink color. So these two summer monsoons operate uh, and provide very large volumes of water. We are aware of the Ganga floods. We are aware of the Brahmaputra floods. We are also aware of the floods in China, especially Yangtze floods and the Yellow River floods. So the Southwest monsoon provides the water, huge water for our floods. And the East Asian monsoon provides the water for floods in China. Smaller but most crucial is what you see coming from the West. It's called westerly disturbances. They bring water not from Bay of Bengal, not from Indian Ocean, not from the China Sea, but they bring the water from Caspian Sea and Mediterranean and provides very crucial winter precipitation of which a large part then takes the shape of snowfall and gets stuck into the mountains providing us with snow melt, very vital snow melt for them as the, as the spring comes in April, May, we get the snow melt which is vital for irrigation of our uh, winter crops. So these are the three major sources of uh, water from the atmospheric circulations of southwest monsoon, the East Asian monsoon, and the westerlies. Remember this picture because this will tell you when and where we get our water or drought, uh, surplus water, floods, or drought. Next slide, please. Now, we have this very large precipitation, which is, in my opinion, is the largest uh, extraction of water uh, from the atmosphere. Himalaya is, I call, the largest uh, water transforming machine from the atmosphere. It brings the water down onto the surface. And when it comes to the surface, it flows out through 10 major rivers, of which Ganga is one. But like Ganga, there are 10 such important rivers. You can see on the uh, topmost right hand side, Yellow River. Yellow River is crucial for the Chinese civilization. Yellow River is where silk was produced first. Some varieties of paddy was produced first. Then we have Yangtze, the second largest Chinese, uh, second most important Chinese river, I'm sorry, uh, on which we have an industrial uh, revolution uh, at, at the lower end near the delta. Shanghai, the industrial revolution of Shanghai uh, takes place with the help of the river Yangtze. Then we have Mekong, we have Salwin, Iravadi, and we come to Brahmaputra. West of Brahmaputra is Ganga, which is the main uh, river of our discussion, but it is one of the 10 rivers having its typical problems. All the 10 river basins have their serious problems. West of Ganga is the Indus. It has its own very crucial problem. It is the lifeline. The, the, the river of life for Pakistan is Indus. Similarly, you have the Amudarya just north of Indus as the lifeline for many uh, of the uh, states, Tajikistan, 
Uzbekistan, where uh, water slowly gets scarce. As we come from the east to west, from Brahmaputra to Ganga, Ganga to Indus, Indus to Amudarya, and then above Amudarya, we have another river basin from the Himalaya, got Tarim. Tarim is almost in a desert. It gets lost in a desert. It doesn't go to a sea. Uh, Tarim is part of the desert area of China called Xinjiang. So here we have the 10 major rivers uh, coming from the Himalaya. All of them are rivers of life. Ganga is probably the important river for us as, as a rivers of life. It is called Mother River for India. And you will be surprised that uh, Yellow River the Huanghe in Chinese is also called the mother river of uh, China because the Chinese civilization was nurtured in the Yellow River Basin. <clears throat> the North Indian civilization was initially nurtured in the Ganga Basin and that's why today we give so much of importance to Ganga. Uh, this introduces the 10 river basins and I will come to now the issue of what's the challenge in the river basins, all these and particularly in Ganga. Next slide, please. Now, this is the Yellow River. You can see from the color, Yellow River is the also called the mother uh, river of China. And it's fertile uh, sediment is the creator of the initial agricultural economy of the Yellow River Basin, which slowly grew into uh, city-based uh, economies. And much of China's uh, agricultural product, food grains, comes from the Yellow River Basin. Next slide, please. Similarly, we have the Ganga. This is the end of the Ganga at the Sundarbans, uh, where fishing uh, boats can only ply, no other uh, large boats can ply into the small uh, uh, streams and uh, branches that Ganga gets into. And uh, Ganga is equally a sediment laden river, and all the sediment then is deposited at the Sundarban, which is advancing towards the south, uh, some 30, 40, 50, 60 uh, years back, the front of the land and water in Sundarbans was much to the north. Now, slowly, it has expanded towards the south because the sediment is coming and creating new land. Next, please. Now, is, uh, we have heard of the word miracle. Now, in, in, in Ganga, we have the largest population in a river basin, the largest population density of river basins of the world, and the food basket and irrigation potential of India is in the Ganga Basin. Now, is it a miracle or we can call it a gift of nature? In the history of uh, growth of civilizations, I have mentioned this, that both the Yellow River and the Ganga have provided the basis for initial agriculture and then formation of small towns two trading centers, two large towns. Uh, in the history of Ganga Basin, we have something called the Solasa Janapada, the 16 large human settlements, and they're all in the Ganga Basin. And that is how the Ganga Basin population started to depend on the fertile water, fertile land, uh, and a lot of additional uh, crop to be traded. Now, 
all these rivers from the Hindu Kush Himalaya are facing governance challenges, serious governance challenges. It could be from population, it could be from mismanagement of the sediment, it could be from the uh, pollution which the population inflicts on the river. How do we address this and extraction of water for irrigation in the upstream? Next, please. Now, uh, uh, could, could you just tell me the timing, give me an advance notice 15 minutes before my time is over? And added to all this is the global warming and climate change, which is altering the hydrograph, the flow characteristics in all rivers, in all rivers, and uh, not tuning it to the present agriculture. We have to find a new agriculture. We have to found a new equilibrium between availability, new availability of water in the climate change period and utilization, if we could uh, uh, sort of adjust our requirements and adjust our supplies, we could have probably uh, add what is called the uh, climate change adaptation, we could have gone, but we cannot do that. Can you drink in summer, uh, in the beginning of the summer, all the water that you need till the sort of four or five months of summer period. We cannot. We need regular supply. And that regular supply uh, is being affected by climate change. Now, what is happening in the governance challenge of the Ganga is the changes in the flow regime of streams and rivers. Then changes in the uh, com sorry competing needs of ecosystem services for both human requirements and the requirements of the natural processes humans have taken too much from the river some of the rivers are uh, Yellow River went fully dry. It did not go to the sea for several years. Ganga is facing the problem between India and Bangladesh that not enough is reaching Bangladesh. <coughs> so this whole issue of changing availability of water is crossing transboundary conflict between two nations, between two states, between two districts, and finally two neighboring farmers. If you have a canal and the one farmer takes much of the water, the other one doesn't uh, get it, they start fighting. And uh, if you know that uh, Punjab Haryana is the center of our uh, green revolution, ir irrigated green revolution, it is also the maximum number of killings there occur often on issues of water conflict, canal level water conflict. So these are the uh, serious governance issues, growing decline in the quantity of water is probably the single most. Next, please. Now, the miracle is not continuing in practice. It is not continuing in practice. We have conflicts. I will come to the naming of the conflicts and serious transboundary uh, tensions and disputes over quantity and quality of water. Uh, freshwater has started. Now, here I want to say one uh, couplet or one, two sentences 
which I would like everyone to take seriously and probably make it a slogan out of this exercise is that uh, we cannot protect the rivers of life. We cannot protect the rivers of life while degrading the life of the rivers. We cannot protect the rivers of life while degrading the life of the rivers. If you understand this slogan, probably you will understand what is needed uh, in the, in the uh, future times in terms of proper governance of rivers. Next, please. Now, this is Kaveri. We all know that there was a period when Kannadigas could not feel safe in Tamil Nadu. Tamils could not feel safe in Karnataka. This is Kaveri at uh, Tanjavur. Kaveri's conflict is very well known. This is, at, to some extent, governance is applied. The courts are there. There is a Kaveri tribunal, but they are not very effective. Now, I show you something which is much more devastating in terms of collapse of governance. This is one well with muddy water. All other wells in the vicinity are dry. And 15 village people are trying to fight with each other to get a little bucket of muddy water from this well. And I'm sure some of you might be dev devastated by looking at this. This is the real situation. And this is governance crisis at the micro level. Uh, we talk of Kaveri, that is a governance crisis between two states. This is a governance crisis between two individuals. The one standing next to me is also fighting for the same volume of muddy water as I am doing it. So this is the nature of the crisis of our rivers. Now, one very important aspect of our river flows, uh, and here we distinguish ourselves from the European characters, but European characters are, uh, the, uh, they provide the books for our engineering education. The books have not been rewritten based on the South Asian or Indian characteristics. You can see that uh, the white line, which is the rainfall in Oxford, uh, throughout the year. It's almost the same rainfall everywhere, every, in all months. And if you see the uh, green line, which is rainfall in Delhi, you will see exactly opposite. We call it, I, I, I started calling it long back, the, the Oxford has a horizontal hydrograph, Delhi has a vertical hydrograph. <coughs> and this is very important uh, for the absence of good governance in our rivers. We have to create a science which is uh, dictated by the vertical hydrograph and not by the horizontal hydrograph. You know that uh, the engineering, water engineering in Roorkee, in India, started at Roorkee, uh, where an Englishman, called Thompson Engineering College. He started it, and that slowly became Roorkee Engineering College. That became the Roorkee University, then became IIT Roorkee. And throughout the country, we have the same intellectual uh, uh, sort of input into water education, which is brought from England. And there is hardly any local applicability, which is one of the reasons we are facing governance challenges. Next. Now, what is this governance challenge? I call it the challenge is the dominance of reductionism and the absence of holistic ideas. We try to look at water, river flows, only as volumes of water. You go to an engineer, they will say, 
at this point the river is having so many cubic feet of water passing in one second but river flows are not merely volumes of water and we have something called webs water energy biodiversity and sediments river flows are constituted by water not only its volume but also its quality what is the chemical content of that water can you drink it can you use it for irrigation that is w e is energy every river has an energy and that energy is extracted in the higher uh, altitude areas called hydropower generation then we have uh, sediments every energetic river cuts the banks and creates sediments and i will come to the use of the sediments in the ganga system and uh, largely but most importantly it is the biodiversity which is economically attractive for us fish or there are other important support systems the biodiversity provides the the green growth that takes place in the near a near shore areas of oceans is a major food item for fish so uh, do not think that governance of rivers is governance of qsex governance of rivers is governance of webs water energy biodiversity and sediment uh i think time is passing very fast and i will go to the next slide one can talk hours on this but i will go to the next slide which is uh, how the integration we are talking of reductionism reductionism to holistic knowledge it involves a process of integration reductionism reduces the river into small parts those who are hydrologists they only know the volume of water those who are sedimentologists only know the sediment those who are fish people they only know the fish but river is one river is one where fish exists sediment exists water exists energy exists and we need an integration now time being short i will only talk of uh, the need for integrated knowledge but uh, if you go into the document called uh, governing the water tower of asia produced by observer research foundation the details are available uh, if i could give, get a little bit idea about the time left shashwat yeah so we 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 are there almost at that half an hour mark I, if you can okay. wrap up i, I will quickly have... now yeah. go to the ganga part of it the steps of integration are very clearly laid out in that paper uh, i will not uh, use the time uh, for describing the integration it's a very intellectually challenging process uh, epitomized by this uh, the diagram linkage diagram this is uh, the integration among the social sciences which is called primary integration this is another primary integration integration of natural sciences and then the integration of the uh, the uh, knowledge of the stakeholders who may not have degrees in social science or natural science and then the linkage between these integrated knowledges is a secondary integration and after the secondary integration is applic applied to challenging situations like the the hazards etc you get a new knowledge as a result of the application of old knowledge and that integrated uh, gets integrated as a tertiary integration i will not go into details i will just introduce the ganga fascinating river ganga comes from the himalay this is ganga in nepal one of the ganga is not please do not mistake ganga 
originating in Gangotri or Gomuk alone. Ganga, much of the water comes from other river systems which passes through Nepal. Ganga, Jamuna, they originate in India, but much of the other rivers, they originate uh, in either Tibet or Nepal and comes to India through Nepal. This is interesting to see the bridge over the Ganga and the background is the Himalaya. Himalaya meaning the abode of snow and uh, uh, ice. And as I said, molten water in April, May and June is very crucial for our irrigation. Now this is Ganga at Gangotri, Surya Kund at Gangotri. And you can see already the water is full of sediments. It is power is there. Sediment is there. If you go in details, you will find the biodiversity, small, small bio elements and water is visible. So if you ask an engineer to tell what is this, they will say 80 cusacks. But if you ask an ecologist, ecologist will say, so much of water with so much of chemical content, having so much of sediment, having these biodiversities and loses so much of energy as a result of this fall. So this is the, as the Gangot Gangotri water further flows down, it goes to Haridwar. And this is the very famous and the first major river engineering application called the uh, upper Ganges Canal, starting from Rurki, goes to Kanpur, fertilizing, irrigating a huge area where Uttar Pradesh became a, a, a good uh, belt for food production. This is the uh, Ganga Canal, not the main Ganga. Uh, but we uh, people always take bath in this canal and think that we are taking bath in the main Ganga. Now, as, as the river comes down, it becomes broader, it becomes slower, and transportation becomes easier. You cannot easily uh, have boat transportation in such uh, in the canal, which passes through Haridwar. But lower down, you always have possibilities of the boat uh, transportation. And Ganga is a major transportation route right from Bay of Bengal to upstream in Elava, then further upstream, uh, boats uh, do travel and much cheaper than road or train uh, or railway traveling. But Ganga has other uh, features like sediment. It creates new land. Sediment deposited creates new land as the children are playing here on the new land. But there is nothing like a free lunch, new land, causes the old other side, the old land to get devastated by cracks. And that goes into the water. And that water finally carries the sediment to the Sundarbans. And this is the Sundarban where the sediment is extremely important for the Sundarban forests. And, and uh, uh, th these are the breathing roots of the Sundarban forests, which, which are called mangrove forests. Now, I have come from the mountain sources to the delta called the Sundarbans. It is the largest uh, mangrove forest, continuum, continued mangrove forest in the world, and uh, also provides immense governance challenges. Now, with that, my time probably is over. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I hope some amount of uh, understanding I have been able to create on the vastness of the Hindu Kush Himalaya and the challenges of governance of the Ganges, which is one of the 10 major rivers out of the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jayantada. It was, it was, I know we were pressed on time. As you said, we can go on discussing. In fact, your monograph goes into a lot of details about this 
the Hindu Kush mountain range and how it's the water tower of Asia. You know, just just briefly touching upon, we have we have a couple of minutes before we move on to our next speaker. Just bringing to fore some of the interesting points that you you made during your presentation, and you know, one kind of the slogan that you use kind of stood out for me. You said you cannot protect rivers of life while degrading the life of rivers. If you could just expand on that thought. It, it, it could help us understand what what you know what the depth of that uh, sentiment meant. Well, I think uh, if one opens the eyes, one can understand that uh, we always talk of protecting Mother Ganga, and then uh, uh, we just had in uh, West Bengal the. Durga Puja, where on the last day you call it the victory of the good over evil. And then evil takes over in the river. You throw all the dirty things, including the image, with all chemical components in the, in the paints used in the image and create a dirty river. So in theory, in slogans, in advertisements, in uh, making uh, names of ministries, we call it, we are for uh, rehabilitating Ganga. And that's good. But what each of us need to understand that we all have a responsibility and uh, not purely looking at the slogans, but realizing the slogans in our behavior how many of us do not throw things onto the river and 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 uh, the the rivers become absolutely polluted i'm not talking of even the throwing of uh, dead bodies but uh, I'm, I'm talking of uh, throwing of even flowers or paints or uh, images of uh, the gods and goddesses. Now, here is we have to mix, make our slogan meet our behavior. And that is why I call it we cannot uh, really uh, protect our uh, the rivers of life while actually attacking. I am using a stronger word while actually attacking the life of the rivers. If, you, if, if these two sentences are understood, I think we will get a lots and lots of advancement in our approach to rivers, especially the Ganga. Okay. Also, one thing, Jantada, there has been numerous um, uh, the reports that have been coming out from World Bank or IPCC have been talking about the kind of, you know, uh, the warming up that's happening in the Himalayas and the kind of consequences that that will be, you know, coming out in the uh, coming decades or so. Uh, what is your assessment of the kind of changes that are taking place? Because at one time we get one set of reports which kind of, uh, you know, kind of tell us that, you know, there's an increased glacial melt. While there are other disputing reports which talk about, you know, actually the some of the glaciers are, you know, increasing in height. So is, the, is there a parity in terms of the data that comes out from that thing? And what do we need to fix this kind of, you know, uh, the mismatch that is happening on that front? Yes, uh, I had been asked by the IPCC to be one of the uh, pre-publication expert reviewers for the synthesis report for the AR6 assessment report number six. Now, global warming is not an uniform phenomenon. When we talk of two degrees, when we talk of 1.5 degrees, it is the global average. The Himalaya is data-based. I'm not talking of model-based. I'm talking of data-based. Himalaya, Tibet has warmed, while the rest of the world average <clears throat> is 1.2 or 1.3. The Tibetan uh, actual measurement had shown 
five to six degrees Celsius of warming. So we are depending on the Himalayan rivers is so far it had been good, but under climate change, there is a lot of risk. Now, uh, you have uh, mentioned the whole issue of what will happen. Now, I go to the fundamentals. The oceans are the sources of rainfall. It is not the Himalaya which is creating the rainfall. Ocean is providing the atmosphere with water vapor. And with global warming, the ocean is warming. And uh, you know, when you want to make a tea, you put uh, a teapot either in an electric heater or in the flame. And when it warms up, it puts up a lot of vapor. So a warmer ocean puts up more vapor into the atmosphere, which carries more potential rainfall in the land. Of course, large part of the uh, evaporation, evaporated water, is drained back to the sea as rainfall, which is rainfall on the sea. But what we need is rainfall on the land. Rainfall on the land also increases. And uh, since the temperature has risen, the formation of snow becomes difficult. Larger area is then rain fed. And smaller areas are uh, snow fed. It doesn't need rocket science to understand that if your temperature is increasing and which is easy measurement throughout the world that temperature is increasing and if temperature is increasing there will be more rainfall than snowfall because the raindrop will not get the opportunity to become snow because the temperature has risen large part of the rainfall so when there is less snowfall, there will be less uh, snow on the mountain tops, less ice for feeding the glaciers, and glaciers are retreating. Yes, but as I said, global change is not an uniform two degree warming for all places. In the Himalaya, particularly in the western extreme, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, there are instances of the glaciers enhancing downwards, more, more ice and snow. So by the climate process, there is more snowfall at a particular area. But large parts of the Himalaya, we are seeing less and less uh, 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 glacier extent. Glaciers are going back. These are measured ones. It is not modeled ones. So there is a uh, it, it should not be taken that it is a counter thesis. The, the diversity of climate change makes some area receive more snow and ice and much of the other area receive less snow and ice. That is why we have this uh, the, the dichotomy in the Himalaya. Yeah. But on the whole, we are having a problem with receding uh, glaciers. Okay. One more thing, Jay, that I, and you kind of touched upon your, uh, I think so, it's, it's the question that uh, I think is, uh, you touched upon the conflicts that arise out of water, which is, which is, we are seeing even states within India are kind of, you know, at, at loggerheads when it comes to distribution of water. But with this whole changing dynamics that are there, how do you see uh, the whole, you know, uh, the uh, the water politics playing out at the water towers of Asia, and more importantly, with a lot of human interactions that are happening, right? You know, the building of numerous dams, the Three Gorges Dam, or you know, structures like that. How do you foresee these kind of events playing out in the days to come? Yes, transboundary challenges are extremely important. And in 1947, rivers in India, larger India, suddenly became transboundary rivers. In Bangladesh, we got Brahmaputra cut between Brahmaputra in India and Brahmaputra in Bangladesh. Tista also, Ganga also. On the Western Pakistan side, we 
had problem. We had really difficult situation with Indus and its tributaries. And we had an agreement called the Indus Water Treaty, which divided the six rivers of the Indus system, three to India, three to uh, Pakistan, which is holding on pretty well till now. But it is also supposed to be renewed. So unless we have better knowledge, we have better governance, holistic understanding, uh, we only will talk of volume of water. If you see the most crucial India-Bangladesh 1996 agreement on sharing, they only talk of QSEX. Now, so many QSEX are coming, this much will go to Bangladesh, this much will go to India. Now, Farakka is there. Farakka is not only obstructing the flow of water, it is also obstructing the flow of biodiversity. It is obstructing the flow of sediment. It is also obstructing uh, flow of energy. Now, in this situation, we have an accumulation of sediment which is going backwards up to Kosi. And Nitish Kumarji, as uh, Chief Minister, had told Farakka ko tode dalo. Farakka ko tode dalo was a slogan given by East Pakistan long back that Farakka is stopping the water to East Pakistan coming from India. Now, Nitish Kumar ji says Farakka is creating floods in Bihar, which is uh, 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 accused of the excessive accumulation of sediment. So we have to really understand through the web's understanding of river flows and not the hydrological engineering understanding, narrow reductionist engineering. And uh, this uh, transboundary issues will not only be between Pakistan and India, Bangladesh and India, it is between Nepal and India, and probably someday Bhutan and India will also have this problem. So interesting, yeah. That's that's an interesting, and I, and we have uh, we will be speaking about the floods in uh, Bihar subsequently. So uh, I would at this juncture, you know, uh, bring in uh, our next panelist, uh, Anthony Anthony Achiavati, uh, who's who's a historian of science and technology. He's a cartographer and an architect. He's also a professor at the Yale University and working on connections between science and design in Asia and the Americas. But most importantly, he has been an author of a very important and interesting book, uh, Ganges Water Machine, Designing New India's Asian River. This was the first comprehensive mapping and history of India's uh, Ganges River ba Basin in half a century. It was a mammoth exercise which spanned over a decade of his work that he did along the, you know, the, the shores of the river. He's also a founding editor of Manifest, a journal of American architecture and urbanism. So without much ado, you know, Anthony, I'd like to invite you to share your thoughts with us today. You're on mute, Anthony. I, I hopefully I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Excellent. And I hope you can see the slide, yeah? Yes. Ah, okay. So... Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Shashwat, for the very kind introduction, and of course to Professor Kunal Sharma for the uh, invitation, and, and everyone at Azim Premji University. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you uh, today. I'm in New York. It's 4:45 in the morning, um, so I'm very much excited to be with you uh, today. I'd like to speak about the virtues of seeing like a mud skipper, which is pictured here. These beautiful amphibious fish can live on land for days on end, and these fish that live on land easily move between wet and dry, hard and soft conditions. Indeed, they are mud-loving creatures that have inspired my working in the Ganga River Basin for the past now 17 years. They not only move between wet and dry with ease, but they have also evolved so that when they are above water, they see clearly like human beings. Whereas when we submerge ourselves, our vision becomes wavy due to wa how water refracts light uh, different than air. Mud skippers continue to see clearly and can see long distances. This kind of double vision, I think, can teach us a lot of about how to incorporate environmental uncertainty into our work. 
as stewards of the built environment. And hopefully they can assist in seeing beyond dichotomies like hard and soft, water and land, living and non-living. I spent a better part of a decade uh, seeing like a mud skipper uh, to create a dynamic atlas of the world's most densely populated and actually hyper-engineered river base in the Gunga. Rather than try to shoehorn uh, uh, field work and archival research into a short presentation, presentation today, um, which is a book, an exhibition uh, that was mentioned before, Ganges Water Machine, I'll share with you some mud-loving moments that epitomize the virtues of seeing like a mud skipper. Seeing like a mud skipper means attending to this substance, silt. Ever since the subcontinent collided with Asia 50 million years ago, trillions upon trillions of tons of silt have been shed from the ever-growing Himalayas during the tempestuous firewater cocktail that we call the monsoons. This silt is what makes the basin rich for agriculture and its choreography rewards scrutiny. Today, today indeed, between one and 1.6 billion tons of silt are shed annually from the Himalayas and across the Gangetic Plains. Now that means that, for instance, I'm not going to have time to talk to you about, say, James Rennell's descriptions of the Ganga River Basin in terms of the vapors uh, that the previous speaker was just mentioning that are wafted from, say, the Bay of Bengal that radically transform these river channels uh, that was read uh, back in London uh, as part of the larger East India Company's uh, colonization of Asia. But the, this description, when we, when we hear it, it's almost like uh, Renel is describing uh, the Ganga River Basin in section. Yet when he makes a map, it's a map that looks like this, where rivers are drawn as parallel lines, roads uh, link up with uh, cities that just become dots, which is incredibly useful if you want to collect taxes or move an army around. But it's a kind of flattening of space because imperialism and colonialism requires a kind of flattening of space in order for it to work. And in fact, that's so much of the legacy that we have within cartography today, the world over, in terms of these histories of flattening space. So part of my job in mapping Ganga was really to try to start to thicken it more. That also means that, for example, I won't tell you about Jules Verne's incredible description of there's a kind of electric charge that happens across the Gangetic Plains in the months leading up to the monsoons. Yet when Verne has to make a map, say in 1880, for this book, it becomes again this kind of flattening of space where Ganga just becomes a series of plumbing lines, cities are drawn as dots, and then we can see kind of the Himalayas shaded slightly differently. Uh, it means also that I'm not going to have time to tell you all about the Yatra Nakshas, right, that I collected throughout my journeys, these pilgrimage maps, where we see these incredible terrestrial sites that are imbued with celestial significance, so many mandirs, right, that are throughout the Himalayas, yet we don't see the Terry Dam or all of the incredible amounts of infrastructure that have been put in place to radically transform the larger basin itself. It also means that, and I, uh, it means I'm not going to have time to talk about Ganga's descent, which I think is such an important uh, story in terms of understanding the cult larger cultural landscape for so many millions of people within the basin. But of course, one of the things that I've always found really uh, quite provocative and evocative about the about Ganga's descent is, of course, when we understand it of Shiv catching her in his hair that we understand the basin then again, not as two parallel lines, but really almost as sopping wet hair, because of course, Ganga's descent would be so great to shadow the earth. But again, I'm not going to have time to talk about that in this amount of time. I'm also not going to do the kind of BBC, Ganges, India's dying mother, where I show this hazy background and then the BBC correspondent who's having a hard time breathing because of the smell coming from this mala. That's not the kind of work that I do. I'm not going to also talk about Jugad, right? The kind of techniques that people have developed for trying to do, uh, to deal with uh, making water potable, for instance, these kind of highly decentralized technologies, endless YouTube videos for it. Or say what uh, development specialists love, these kind of life straws where on one end is non-drinking water, on the other side, through a set of filtration devices, you're able to drink it. Uh, development specialists seem to love this, or you know the kind of systems that have been developed for uh, condensation of water, so that you again can decentralize and have potable water that's maybe not drinkable at first. I believe that all of these kinds of technologies are certainly valuable, 
but they produce this, which is essentially a urinal that you see just placed near the Triveni Sangam in Prayagraj, Allahabad. As we can see, there's a urinal here. It's obviously trying to suggest a different kind of behavior, but it's not part of a larger system. So the work that I do really tries to look at kind of not flying, you know, uh, a kilometer above the, the, the land and a little bit higher than, you know, five foot six on the ground, but a kind of middle scale where the kind of very big and the very small meet. And so those are the kinds of drawings uh, that I make of the, of the larger river basin I'm going to share with you today. The area, of course, where I was doing most of this work, according to the last census in 2011, you know, UP, it's the same size as Great Britain or half the size of uh, California and the United States, but it produces about 20% of India's food grains. Yet the state is still really discussed as a kind of uh, primarily rural, uh, even though we have such a large population density of over 200 million people, it's probably closer to 270 million today, as many of you know, It'd be the sixth largest or most populous country in the world. And, you know, one finds maps, say, of the irrigation works of UP, especially before it was bifurcated into uh, Uttarakhand and, and, and present day UP, where we see the level of hydrological activity, and of course, the basin, as was mentioned before by the previous speaker, is not just, of course, in, in India. It uh, overlaps with uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Tibet, China. Um, but if, most of it is, in fact, in uh, India. If I were to kind of take what in architecture and engineering we call an exploded axonometric, where, say, I'm looking at the river basin from, say, outer space, and I just turn it ever 45 degrees, Hopefully here you can see the shape or the kind of footprint of the larger basin. Well, when I do that and I start to look at it in terms of its layers, I'm able to see that this is the amount of rain-fed agriculture and this is the amount of irrigated agriculture. So I hope you can see that there is this kind of dark mass that really connects with the larger Indus and Brahmaputra river basins that creates this hydrological supersurface. It is the most engineered landscape on the planet. It's composed of, of course, canals and nullas, but also so many millions of tube wells as well, that not just only supply water for agriculture, but also for so many urban environments as well. Now, when I say that this is a kind of machine, I'm referring to what uh, V. Lakshmi Narayana and uh, Roger Reve christened in 1975 as the Ganges water machine. When they were describing it as a kind of machine, it's not like a chronometer, it's not like a, a highly sophisticated mechanical watch, let's say, that was used to find longitude. Instead, it's more like Luke Skywalker's bionic arm in The Empire Strikes Back. It's a technology with a biology. Or is it a biology with a technology? It's a kind of cyborg. It's been co-authored both by people and non-people alike. And the two principal characters that I really look at in terms of infrastructures of the larger Ganga Basin uh, in the making of this into a kind of laboratory of water management in the 19th and 20th centuries are really on the one hand, the monumental Ganga Canal, upper and lower. It's the longest canal system in the world today, over 12,000 kilometers long. Think of it as a kind of making a new river out of an existing river, a kind of artificial river. Uh, it's like a highway. And then the tube well is the exact inverse. It's a kind of system of sinking uh, a tube, right? Drilling it down generally into the ground, attaching a pump to it to draw up groundwater. Uh, it's a highly decentralized technology. It's what makes, it's what allows India to be the largest consumer of groundwater in the entire world. And because tube wells have largely been an unregulated economy since their introduction in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, we don't know how many tube wells there are or where they're placed, but they are an incredibly important player in terms of radically transforming this landscape. So I, in the book, I look at these kind of two infrastructural extremes. As I think was mentioned before, really the monsoons are this kind of architect of the larger basin. So this is a set of drawings, again, that were also kind of shown before of the southwest and northeast monsoons as they enter the larger subcontinent, that differential in temperature between the Arabian Sea and the 
the Bay of Bengal and larger Indian Ocean world is what produces that fire water cocktail that we call the monsoons. But what I do is I also cut what in architecture and engineering you call vertical sections, like cutting through a slice of pie or cake, for instance, where you hopefully can see here an array of cutting five very long sections through the subcontinent, starting in the Himalayas and going into the Arabian Sea and into the Bay of Bengal. And I hope what you can see here is that there is this uneven bowl that's been created where the Himalayas, of course, are this incredibly tall geological wall. And then we have the Gangetic Plains down below uh, where so, so many people of the larger Ganga Basin live. Well, what I do is I don't only just draw the say the, ge the physical geography, I map out the rainfall patterns in section as well. So usually when we show and draw rain or precipitation, it's again from this kind of uh, plan view or outer space view looking down, but instead I'm looking at the relationship between geography and climate and weather patterns in terms of precipitation. I won't go into great detail about this, but I try to better understand the larger geographies of rain and precipitation across the subcontinent in my work. As I mentioned before, it's not just then that there's this incredible deluge of water, it's between one and 1.6 billion tons of silt are shed annually. These are a set of photographs I took in October of 2005 in Varanasi uh, near Mirgat, where I was staying. And I hope you can see that it's October. There's no really clouds in the sky. It's quite hazy, but you can see that the water is going up and down within the river channel. And from the 11th to the 12th, you can see just how much that's changing but also, of course, the amount of silt that gets play, uh, deposited here as well, uh, just over the course of these four days. Now, we're over 700 kilometers from the Bay of Bengal, but you would think that this was tidal. But this is, of course, just the incredible amounts of silt and water that are coming down from the Himalayas and from all of, through all of the different nadis and nalas that exist across the larger Gangetic Plains. So this is to give you a sense of that choreography of soil and sediment that I think are so important to understanding the, the geometries and geographies of the basin. <clears throat> now, I started this work in 2004. And if you go back to 2004, you think, well, some of the best books that I could really find on the basin were, say, photo, photo essays uh, by Raghavir Singh or kind of madcap um, adventures like Eric Newby's uh, Slowly Down the Ganges, where his wife divorces him by the end of the book because it's been such a bumpy and rough ride, or say, irrigation projects in India, this kind of uh, avalanche of statistics, but nothing about how do people actually incorporate the deep rhythms of the monsoons into their daily lives. And so as an architect, I was very interested in how do you start to understand that spatially? How do people organize themselves? Because I think a lot of the world could learn from the intelligence that's been developed across the larger Gangetic Plains to do this. So Google Earth, really low resolution, is just going live in 2004. India has greater concerns about Google Earth compromising national security than even the state of Israel at the time. So Google Earth, extremely low resolution. Drones existed, but they're mostly being used by George Bush's administration to assassinate people. So I didn't have access to, say, uh, drones. The GRACE satellite system, uh, which is used to really monitor gravitational pull and groundwater, its resolution was still so low that I couldn't possibly rely on this either. So I wrote what's called a Fulbright proposal, which is a, uh, a grant that you get from the US government and Indian government to come to India to map the river really with a very clunky Garmin E-Trex GPS handheld system that you see here. And on the right, a Nikon camera uh, to photograph and document it. I, much to my surprise, got the grant to do this research. And when I got to India, I hoped that I would find contemporary maps, but in fact, the best that I could find were these from the Survey of India. Many of them were from the 1960s, sometimes 70s, but there were usually tracings of existing maps already. So they weren't incredibly accurate, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. But so I really had no choice but to walk the land. And I'm showing you these photographs, not because of how bad I look with long hair, I know it's terrible, 
Uh, but instead, I really had to be a barefoot hydrographer, cartographer, and historian to go out and do this work. So this work that I thought would take me just one year, Excel, to do, it took 10 years to do uh, because I walked really the length of, the, of much of the basin in order to map it and to better understand it. So I went from, you know, Gangotri Glacier, uh, right at Gomuk, all the way through the Gangetic Plains, taking 25,000 photographs and near continuous panorama of the basin itself. I had to stop the book in, in Varanasi just because the book was supposed to be 200 uh, pages, but it ended up being 400. So my publisher really wanted to kill me uh, because of the length of it. But the work extends and ultimately did extend into the, to the larger Bay of Bengal. What I'd like to focus on then in the, the amount of time that I have really left is this city where I was kind of my home base for so much of this work, uh, Ilahabad or Prayagraj, where you can see Ganga to the north, Jamuna to the south. I think this photograph is, very, is fantastic, the satellite photo from 2004, because you can see just the braiding of Ganga versus Jamuna. And the reason for that is that Ganga has incredible amounts of sediment that are mostly from the Himalayas, where of course the Jamuna or Yamuna River is especially fed mostly by the Chambal. Of course, it starts in the Himalayas, but it's mostly fed by non-Himalayan rivers. And it's that sediment that really makes it so different as a kind of, say, a water regime or a, a river regime than, say, the Ganga, which is to the north. And then, of course, here at Allahabad, it makes this incredibly auspicious, abrupt 90-degree turn to meet at the Triveni Sangam. Well, I went to the Sangam every week for a full year to draw it and to map it, as well as to photograph it. So this drawing that you see to the left these tones of violet are how the base, how the river channels and surface water bodies expand and contract over the course of a single year. So the darkest violet is when the river is just pre-monsoon, and the faintest or uh, uh, lightest violet is when it's at its most extreme, uh, post-monsoons. So you can hopefully see just how much of expansion and contraction happens by kilometers in this area. And then I photographed it as well at the Sangam every week, a kind of panorama. So this is that drawing that shows you where I use the solstices and the equinoxes as a large water clock of the earth going about the sun, that those tones of violet correspond to moments in time in relationship to the equinoxes and the solstices. So I try to understand these larger, deeper rhythms between the monsoons and telling time more generally. And then I went and photographed every week here, starting with the month of Mag or Mag Mela, January, February, where hopefully you can see that there's this temporary city that's built here, where you know between three and six million people come to bathe along the uh, the shores of both rivers. Electric, electric lines, plumbing are all laid out for this temporary tent city. But what's amazing is that once that festival ends, the grid of the city still remains imprinted on the sandbars. Farmers come in start growing their crops, harvesting them, the monsoons come and completely wash it all the way. And this is the most intelligent use of space that I've ever witnessed in my life as an architect, because we go from being in hyper urban space to be agricultural in a matter of two weeks, the monsoons come and completely flood the area and wash it all away and it gets re redrawn and rebuilt every year. And so these sets of drawings combine cartography and photography together to get a sense of the social and environmental life of the space and not just its cartographic spaces. These techniques of drawing, they've been profiled by the United Nations and say the Quito papers for the new urban agenda as a way that you can draw the biophysical, political, social, uh, and kind of cultural layers of a river basin together to better kind of put in sync the choreography of people, soils, and water. And of course, we all know when the Kum happens, like this one in 2013, where, you know, 80 to 100 million people are said to come, uh, you know, where we have the pontoon bridges, the pundals, etc. And this is a, a, an unbelievably spectacular sight. But what I think is more spectacular than all of this is that it goes from this to this in two weeks. That is absolutely extraordinary. That's that same bridge that you see there, the rail bridge, to this. 
We can see here then the avenues and the, ta the, the tents are still left tattooed or drawn on the landscape. And farmers use that to organize their agricultural crops. And of course, it all gets washed away. But if this isn't drawn, how can we possibly build on these incredible, supremely intelligent ways of using space? They have to be described, but they also have to be drawn because this is such a, an incredible use of space that's in a very dynamic way. It's not thinking of space as static, but really thinking of it as being dynamic. And I, because I didn't have maps of this area and satellite images were hard to come by, I had to make my own instruments and prosthetics to map the river basin. So I'm gonna show you some of those as well. For example, I created what I call the Gunga uh, surface accumulation sleeve, which is literally a prosthetic that you put over your right arm. And then you have the GPS unit here, you have packaging tape here, and then I had space for my old school Nokia mobile phone that you can see here. Uh, I used the packaging tape to take an imprint of the soil, a lot like the way Spider-Man shoots you know, his web from his wrists. I would shoot packaging tape for a kilometer perpendicular to the river, like you can see here, so that I could collect soil. Because the particle sizes of the soil can tell you a great deal about the behaviors of the river. So I was using packaging tape, misusing it really, in order to do this kind of uh, do-it-yourself remote sensing to make my drawings. And it's, uh, this is a kind of image of that surface accumulation sleeve. Here you can see it, right, wearing it on the arm and kind of taking that imprint. This, this technology then, it's not just that I'm collecting soil. I'm also collecting car parts, marigolds, fecal matter, and it allows me to do a kind of ethnography of the soil. And it's a lot like a colleague of mine that teaches at the University of Tokyo, Catherine Hansen, compares to Katamari Damacy, which is this Nintendo game that was created in 2003, of this little prince who has this orb that he uses to build new galaxies, new stars and galaxies. So the orb starts out where it starts collecting like little spoons and paper clips but starts to collect jungle gyms and then eventually entire cities. So my rolls of packaging tape become these little life worlds of the larger basin in terms of all of the cultural detritus that they collect, as well as the biophysical, let's say, of the, the soil samples. And so I made these instruments to then study those soil samples, like you can see here, and hopefully you can see going from left to right, just very different kinds of soil and cultural detritus that gets collected in all of uh, these very large rolls of tape, which get quite large because they end up being a kilometer long. And I use this then as a technique to move between lab work and field work and the work that I do. So a lot of the work that I was doing is both collecting samples and kind of analyzing them in much the way that say a field botanist might do it, but also in the way that an anthropologist or an ethnographer would do this, and then also doing the kind of assaying and, and lab work as well, of studying these as well. So moving like a sinusoidal wave between the great outdoors and indoor spaces. Now, I, would, I scanned several hundred kilometers of this tape, and uh, what I did was I scanned it, and then I started to look at the different soil structures. Again, I didn't have very sophisticated technology. So what I did was I used the magic wand tool in Adobe Photoshop, which you can use. Oftentimes people might use it, say, when you want to put a tattoo on someone's chest, right, visually. Well, I used the wrong thing for the right purpose. So instead of using it to do something like this, I use the uh, Photoshop magic wand tool to break down all of the particle sizes like you can see here. So I can better understand the behaviors of the river to do particle size analysis. So again, it allows me to do a kind of do-it-yourself remote sensing when you don't have data sets yourself. So it's, a, it's an on the ground kind of technique that I had to develop because I didn't have access to information. Along with that, I developed another extremely sophisticated technology that I call the Gunga Dip Sock, where I bought a hundred pairs of white pristine cotton socks and I would dip them or plunge them into the sediment in order to collect soil samples with the idea that if I needed to bring them back to say the United States to do more research on them, if I got stopped, 
I would just say I was a filthy backpacker that didn't have time to do my laundry, as opposed to having to answer, why do you have all of these soil samples? So again, I had to find different ways, almost guerrilla tactics to do the work that I was doing, which again is why it took a decade to do this work. And so this is uh, from an exhibition I did in Seoul, South Korea, of these techniques of using the wrong thing for the right purpose, say here with the Gunga dip sock that you saw. And so I've made further iterations, like I've taken remote control cars, right, that children play with, and I've repurposed them into rovers, like you see here, so that I can do the collecting of the soils as well, because even though, you know, you're shooting the the packaging tape from your wrist like Spider-Man does with his web, it does hurt your back after a certain point. So this is a rover to, to allow one to start to do that without having to hurt your back. But all of that allows me to make these kinds of drawings that you see here, which really show, again, like I showed you of Allahabad Prague, Raj, I, here I'm showing you transects or these sections, these are between Allahabad and Varanasi, of the nature of not just the Ganga, like you see here and here, but of the larger basin itself, because I really didn't want to understand the river as again, two parallel lines, but instead as a larger watershed, right? Think kind of Shiv's sopping wet hair when Gunga is passing through his, his hair. So I did these drawings and you can think of them, they're a lot like fashion, you know, couture, uh, that you get for say wedding season in India, it's made to fit your body at a very particular moment in time. Whereas ready to wear, like something you get at uh, Big Bazaar or H&M or Mango, you gain a few kilos, lose a few kilos, it still fits. So my drawings have what in apparel design you call an inseam allowance. So they really allow for these extremes to happen on, in the drawing space itself. So the drawings don't become outmoded or outdated before they're even done. So I use these techniques of the wrong thing for the right purpose to make drawings like this. And I do exhibitions of this work as well, where I show kind of, hopefully you can see that uh, soiled sock down below all of the instruments. This was an exhibition I did in New Delhi some years ago with mannequins of these, uh, this here in Seoul of ways of building up one's own drawings of the basin using uh, overhead projectors uh, to do this. But I work all the way from the scale of soils to cities to the larger regional scale, because I think it's really important that we understand how all of these different scales, materials, lifeways of the river basin kind of intersect with one another. And so I've written the book, I've written op-eds for the New York Times and the Indian Express, and then do these exhibitions and workshops, because I think it's really important to engage a larger audience. You can be incredibly intelligent, but if you don't have a way of sharing your work with larger audiences, you're going to lead a very lonely revolution. And so the work that I do <clears throat> very much focuses on do, using very different mediums and methods. And what I would like to close with is that as more and more of the world really faces environmental uncertainty, it's crucial that I think designers, policymakers, and engineers, activists use their skills to both read the world and project the world. Otherwise, I think we are likely to suffer the consequences of sight without the benefits of insight. Thank you. I must admit that has been a very uh, insightful and a fascinating uh, description. I, just like you started, I, I wish I don't have so much time to go in depth with all your adventures that you had. But yes, before we dive down into a more serious uh, you know, aspects that uh, certain some of your observations raise, I want to just quickly ask you, uh, what was the kind of reaction that you had from people around uh, these uh, banks where you were like a long haired Spider-Man shooting, you know, these tapes at the river? You know, I'm, I'm just curious about it. What, what did they, did you find anything? I'm sure they must be amused by your tactics. Uh, yes, I mean, I, people, one, people were oftentimes uh, genuinely very friendly and, and more than often not like kind of uh, curious and interested. And there were certain moments where people, especially in some of the smaller towns and villages, people would come out and start helping me uh, pat down the packaging tape and roll it up. Uh, so, and we would have conversations about what I was doing. 
um, I'm sure that they saw that I was this kind of uh, crazy Firangi Gora, but um, they, in general, people were incredibly kind and, and, and inquisitive about the work that I was doing. And how many pairs of dirty socks that you got back to the US? I, I ended up uh, doing about a hundred. <laughs> Yeah. That must have been a big work of laundry, I guess. Yeah. Well, I didn't wash them. They're all preserved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So coming back to the more important, in these times of, uh, you know, GIS, GPS, satellite mapping and all, where do we see the relevance of drawings and cartography? And how do you, you know, how do you relate to uh, uh, these aspects that are there? That's a great question. I think that, I mean, GIS, like any tool, is kind of a dumb tool, I would say. So it needs intelligent people behind it to analyze it, to interpret it, and to build it. it so, I mean, in a way, I had to create my own GIS sets, my own vector files to do this work. I think that um, one of the things, though, that I think a GIS set uh, struggles a lot with is really when you're dealing with such a densely populated river basin like the Ganga, capturing, I think, the kind of social life and the environmental dynamism of that space is something that I think you can't do in satellite imagery. You can't do it in with drones. It's, I think, something that it, it, it one benefits from spending time to observe how people are co-authoring this space because you know, like for a long time, environmental historians have talked about how do we undo this false binary between, you know, nature and culture. And I think that one of the amazing things about the Gunga Basin is that when you go to it, you see that those two terms are completely pointless and useless in an environment like this, because it's as much constructed by people or humans as non-humans as well. So I tried, I, I, I think that a understanding that co-authoring, there's a certain amount you can do with GIS, but I think oftentimes we can think of these things as technological fixes. And I think that we can have incredible amounts of information, but if we don't know how to interpret it and what to do with it and how to share that with people in a meaningful way, it kind of just gets, you know, saved and forgotten, filed and forgotten. So yeah. I think those are very useful tools. I didn't have access to them when I was doing my work. But I'm working now uh, on developing a set of projects that I've submitted to the government of training other people to use these techniques to start to build up data sets that are very much needed that the government uh, doesn't have. Yeah, and the, these these maps and cartographic maps, also especially from the surveys that were done during the uh, the colonial times, the British and all, can can give you a great idea of you know comparison. Uh, between then and now, which can't, I think so, can't be possible using GIS map. Am I right in that uh, aspect? Uh, you can, I mean, there's a lot you can find out from satellite imagery with like the Oxbow Lakes or with uh, certain, uh, you know, kind of profile signatures of, of river basins. Uh, you certainly can, but I, I, I mean, I, I do think the kind of the, the East India Company and Raj's legacy is, it, there, there are uses for it. Like I think the way that we know uh, James Princeps maps along with so many images and descriptions we have of say Varanasi, we oftentimes think of it as really a city on Ganga, but really for most up and through the, the late 19th century, it was understood as a city of Tals, Coombs, lakes, orchards that were eventually being filled in and that the, the river Ganga was in many ways kind of the back of the city in a lot of ways. So. I think that there, we those written descriptions and cartographic drawings kind of are, are very useful in, in helping us uh, retrieve the lived experiences of people um, in these areas, especially before the 20th century. Yeah, and it was interesting. I, I like the line that you use, you know, saying how cartography and photography can be used to document the social you know, the social aspects. So how has that been, uh, you know, a driving motive for this project of yours? When you undertook it, was, did you envisage it this way or it, it just turned out to be, uh, you know, it took I, a life. I, 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 I mean, I started this work, I'll be perfectly honest. I started it when I was 23. I really didn't know what I was doing um, because I thought that I would find maps 
um, that I, and you know, most of the maps that I was able to see, they said that they weren't supposed to be uh, reproduced or taken out of India. Uh, so uh, no, I kind of had to figure out how to do these things in the field um, uh, in, in trying to figure it out. Um, so no, I, I knew that I wanted to create a dynamic atlas, meaning that I was interested in how do you combine an almanac and an atlas together so that you don't make something that's kind of fixed and static, but instead something that incorporates dynamism. So I knew that that's what I was after, but I didn't necessarily know what it was going to look like. Uh, and I especially didn't know what it was going to look like once I got to India and couldn't see any maps. I mean, I got asked all, far too often, you know, do you work for the CIA? And I don't know anybody who says that they work for the CIA. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, I, the, the thing was there were no maps. The Survey of India hadn't really done any mapping in a comprehensive way of the basin for about half a century when I was doing this work. And I think there's reasons why. I think when you use those kinds of old school cartographic tools that come from colonialism and imperialism, they, are, they take a long time to make and they are already outdated by the time you finish them because a river basin like Ganga is changing so much in terms of population density. And especially once you get to the east of UP, I think, uh, you know, as the, I know the next speaker will speak in greater detail about, I think the, the changing of, of, of riverbeds and just the amount of precipitation radically transforms the landscape. So I think those kinds of old school forms of cartography have a hard time capturing um, that dynamism and how to embed it. Yeah. And uh, mixing up the old school, uh, you know, uh, uh, work with the uh, new uh, new dynamics of uh, Jugaad, as we call it, right? I, I see a lot uh -huh. of Jugaad that you did in your fieldwork. So if you can just briefly touch upon that, the interesting aspects of the fieldwork and, you know, what are the sort of challenges that you face and, you know, those, uh, you know, while you were working on this project itself? Well, I, so the, the long story is, is that my, I had an office, the, I was based in the Department of Geography and Town and Country Planning at Allahabad University. And um, my, the windows in my office had actually been broken from a, a set of protests and riots that had happened a few years before. And most of the biomass was being burned um, not far from my window. And so every day I would have to come in and kind of clean off the soot that was there. And I just started to notice that I would find remnants in that soot of things that were being burned and cleaning it off. And I just kept thinking, well, you know, when I go to the riverbed and I see these kind of different sizes of sediment, that's where I kind of started to come up with, well, how do I start to think about, well, what's the story? I tried to be like a Sherlock Holmes, like a sleuth, like how can I find clues in the riverbed to tell me uh, more about it than I might otherwise be able to figure out from looking at a satellite image or a map. So that's how it happened. It was really serendipitous. I originally was making the, instead of using packaging tape, I was using um, cloth, like cotton cloth. But that I had to get wet and then dry off. And it was incredibly, that got very large and was it, it was not very efficient. So that's why I used the packaging tape, for instance. So it was very iterative. There's a lot of failure in the work that I do that I know we oftentimes don't want to talk about um, uh, because, you know, to fail means you know, to not do well. Uh, but I think, you know, you I learned so much more from the things that didn't work than the things that supposedly did work uh, in, in my research. But I it, it was really through trial and error that I did this work and a lot of false starts and having to kind of change course to do this work. And I was very fortunate that I had the time to do this and I didn't have access to, G to GIS uh, or high resolution satellite imagery. So I really just had to do this work. But uh, it was absolutely amazing because every day was like an adventure for me, right? I mean, I slept uh, outdoors most of the, uh, so, so often stayed in you know villages, on boats, et cetera. I was quite uh, itinerant. Um, I, it was a little bit like being I guess, kind of like Krishna um, roaming the landscape. Yeah. So I think Krishna had a lot more fun than I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm assuming the river must have been a lot more cleaner also at that time. It's just, just coming back to your thing, your experience uh -huh. on the, you know, spending years on the river basin and studying in LA. If I were to ask you to kind of, you know, to summarize for us, what are the broad 
uh, you know learnings that you had uh, on the the whole uh, ganga river basin and you know what do you feel are the implications going forth in the future so broadly speaking i think that there's already in place a way in which so many people within the basin incorporate this uncertainty of the monsoons not just into their daily lives but even in the course of a single year and i think with the kum uh, and magmela site at the triveni sangam it's a kind of microcosm of what happens all throughout the basin you know i mean i would find so many pontoon bridges that were constructed especially between ilahabad and varanasi you know pre monsoon you'd have bazaars that uh, happen there it's kind of temporary towns and then all of that goes away once the monsoons occur but i think that if you don't have drawings that show and give a sense of measure of how people use this there's no way for you to build upon that so that you don't repeat the problems of say the army corps of engineers in the united states of turning the mississippi into uh, a kind of plumbing works right Uh, I think that you really want to avoid something like that with Ganga and I think you need drawings and descriptions so for example the drawing that I did of the Triveni Sangam it's the first drawing to really uh in- show how people incorporate those rhythms over the course of a year it's not like I invented this I'm just describing it but I think you need visual as well as textual and numeric uh data sets in order to describe this because words and numbers fail to capture i would argue the dynamism of a place like the ganga river basin and the last thing i'll say is i think that so much of the world can learn from this and there's more that can be exported from india to other parts of the world that are facing environmental uncertainty and climate change it's uh, as, as opposed to importing methods into india uh, to deal with this so I I really tried to understand the kind of layers of the river basin and its dynamism and to describe it in a way that I hope is useful for other people to hallucinate of what could happen here in terms of its future so that it's not just me as like a single author as a you know Firangi coming and doing this work but instead as somebody who's quite an admirer and describing this I'm sorry the sounds of new york city i think are coming into my mind <laughs> it's speaking up so this just, just uh, finally uh, you know uh, touching upon your uh, uh, lot of efforts have been undertaken uh, to kind of uh, there have been lots of project lots of money lots of resources invested into this whole idea of cleaning up the ganga river of you know beautification and do do you think and just like you mentioned right now the case with the mississippi river you know the the damming of the alaknanda raised so many hackles out here in india uh, and government has also kind of reached out to so what do you make of all these numerous projects that have that have taken over this whole past couple of decades and you know programs like navami gange and so on and so forth how how affected they have been and you know if if i were to ask you to kind of you know share with us where have they worked or where have they failed kind of an analysis well it's a, it's a that's a great and not an easy question to answer uh but i would say that you know i mean i think we know from ganga action plan that was launched properly in 85 by rajiv gandhi i mean it did not work um and uh i think namami ganga uh, it's still quite young i mean it was properly launched in 2014 uh what i but i i think that the best way i can describe it is that you know in the same way that a step well or a bauli is a kind of physical infrastructure but it's also a social infrastructure and what too often happens is this and this isn't just in in uh, india it's the world over we approach these infrastructures as being monofunctional and we know that infrastructures are highly social as well as physical and i think that uh, understanding the social dimensions and not going directly at pollution but instead i think going at it more indirectly through uh kind of sites and services that so many people need like for instance i think the way in which you might reimagine say anala is not just being a site where uh runoff happens but how do you build a kind of civic architecture and space there so how do you maybe transform 
agricultural lands along those, pay farmers above market rate to make those into bioswales and wetlands, which is much cheaper than sewage treatment plants, right, STPs. Most of UP doesn't have electricity 24 hours a day. So instead of saying, oh, we don't have electricity, like see that as, as, as a problem, how do you instead see, well, we don't have uh, uh, 24 hours of visually every day. So then instead, how do we come up with infrastructures that are maybe social and physical that incorporate this dynamism and build, I think, larger, um, you know, in economic terms, there's, there's the stakeholder kind of argument. I don't think in a place like India, that's enough. I think you also have to speak about the kind of sacred and cultural geography of Ganga as well in order to incorporate people. And I think that's historically scared uh, government or, or made them wary as well as big loan, you know, loaning agencies like say the World Bank, for instance, that's changing. But I think you have to find ways of understanding this as social and physical infrastructure and how do you incorporate people to be part of this and not just again, the single, technological fix. So I'm not really answering your question because I think it's kind of a fraught one. Uh, and uh, I've always been lucky in that I've gotten research visas because I've never directly spoken uh, or proposed to work on pollution per se, not because I don't think it's important. But I think that also we know when we, uh, I don't know how many times I would chat with people that even though the fecal coliform level is a thousand times the level that the World Health Organization it should be at the Sangam for bathing, Ganga is still clean and pure. And I think that understanding that kind of social uh, uh, and sacred geography dimension to the river is, is absolutely paramount. Uh, but I don't have the answers necessarily of how to do that. But I, th I hope that the work that I do can be part of the larger conversation that I think is starting to unfold um, with respect to Ganga. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Anthony. And, uh, you know, there are so many questions that we can go on, but as uh, as you were mentioning while you're going through your slide, we don't have time for that. We, huh. we can save it for later. With that, you know, I'd like to invite my next speaker, Eklave Prasad, who's the founder of Make Paine Abhiyan, which is like, you know, uh, Make Paine is effectively translates to wanting the desiring for the clouds you know he's a social development professional for over past 25 years leading a grassroots campaign in rural north bihar since 2005 on decentralized and alternative drinking water framework on solutions and innovative farm based livelihood op options he'll be he'll be you know he'll be bringing to fore the kind of you know interplay of uh, you know the river the floods and the human milieu that we have in one of our you know uh, popular states in west of india east of india i should correct myself my geography is bad thank you so much uh, so all yours uh, uh, th <clears throat> thank you shashwat uh, am i audible yes uh Thank you, Shashwat and Kunal and other colleagues at uh, Azim Premji University for giving me and Make Pine Abhyan to share our experiences over the past 17 years. And also uh, the evolution in terms of how we have start how we started understanding floods and what we got to as of today. Uh, can I have my slide, please? Yes, just just one second. Uh... I just wanted to, I can't see it. Have you uploaded it from your end, Eklavya? Yes, yes, yes. Just can you just click on it again so I'll, I'll kind of see it. Just a second. Yeah, sure. I'm just taking a there are two here. Okay. Can you see it now? Just a moment. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, this talk is largely going to be about floods. And because of the fact that flood happens to be the most frequent and devastating disaster, in uh, this particular uh, section of the Ganga River Basin. And because I've worked 
in Bihar, so I would be largely concentrating on Bihar, though floods are quite uh, prevalent in eastern UP, Bihar, North Bengal, and other uh, river basins like Brahmaputra and Assam, I mean, Assam and Brahmaputra River Basin. So uh, the entire intent here is basically to look at floods, talk about the typologies, and then I'll start sharing about one particular typology of flood, which according to our experiences have been extremely invisible and unexplored. We would deal with a bit of flash floods. And then I'll concentrate more on the takeaways way forward and where do we begin with. So the state that I would be talking about, or the uh, this, uh, this region, is basically North Bihar. And this is the map. And uh, this map is self-explanatory in terms of the kind of uh, rivers we have. So then South, uh, North Bihar has five major rivers. And then you have various small rivers across the, from North West Bihar to North East Bihar. And this is where um, entire talk is going to concentrate on, on the issues which are prevalent there. So when we talk about floods and the way floods are projected, uh, and for a person or for anyone who's dealing with floods, or rather is interested or is researching on floods, these are the kind of images that we often see. And uh, this, these are the kind of images that, are, that often go from Bihar. And uh, when I started working, for me, all of this used to be uh, a kind of an intimidating image. And I used to begin work uh, trying to understand floods from these and then later on go to the field and try to figure out things. And that is when the transition happened in my own understanding of floods, which I'll come to, uh, which I'll talk about later. These are, again, some of the uh, visuals that often come ac comes across. Starting in July and beginning August, uh, we start having these photographs from Bihar saying that, you know, how floods have devastated millions of uh, uh, hectares of land and thousands and thousands of people have been affected. And again, it carries on. And so there are different aspects of... Uh, uh, floods and there are different locations of floods that of, we often come with. Now, the point here is that most of the, the, all the images that I showed you earlier, basically they tend to identify a particular area with a particular kind of flooding. Now, for a person who's away from the context or even within the context and has not explored the incidence of that particular floods, is not able to articulate, or even if they are able to articulate, there are no takers. It is convenient to have a uniform projection of floods because that then tends to help in coming out with solutions or any kind of uh, you know steps to prevent or any kind of uh, steps that would help minimize the impact. So a uniform problem is easy to addressed compared to a problem which has a lot of diversity. So if I have to look at the kind of photographs that I showed you earlier, those are from areas which have riverine floods. Now riverine floods are between embankments of the same river. You have riverine floods which is post breach. That means the river breaches the embankment and is actually flowing in the area where there should be, shouldn't be any water. And that is supposed to be this uh, flood-free zone. Then you have water logging along the embankment. Inside, in fact, on the countryside. So the riverside is between the embankment, and countryside is outside the embankment. Now, their water logging normally happens because there is the entire flow of the rainwater outside uh, the embankment is it does not have any drainage system which can actually take the water inside the river. So that's why the water logging happens. Uh, then we have uh, floods uh, which are basically between embankments of two river systems. Now, uh, and there you have uh, floods, you have water logging, and then you have inundation. So this is a very different kind of 
and area that we are talking about. Similarly, we have riverine floods and river ero bank erosion areas, which have a different prop set of problems. The occurrences are different, the duration is different, and so happens to be the case with flash floods. Flash floods within in rivers, the uh, rivers that bring in flash floods which which do not have embankments, and there are flash floods uh, in in rivers which are embanked. Now, the characteristic of both these are also extremely diff is is definitely different. So we have, uh, and others are basically riverine floods uh, with riverbank erosion. That means within the embankment, there are river erosion, uh, riverbank erosion which is happening, and it has its own sets of problems. And last but not the least, urban flooding. Now, basically, urban flooding is seen as, uh, as I mean, it's termed as a flood, but actually there is a lot of questions that can be raised whether it's an, uh, it, whether it's flooding or not. Because majority of the problem as, as regards to urban inundation is because of, uh, you know, um, drainage uh, which has been clogged or has been encroached upon. And there is hardly any space for the rivers, I mean, the water to flow into any of the uh, rivers or any, any common place uh, along the city. Now, the point here that I'm trying to make is that when we have different floods, but we project it as a uniform flood. Does it make any difference? Are there any issues with regard to it? And are we able to address the problems? Or we are trying to push for a uniform, as I said earlier as well, are we trying to push for a kind of a uniform strategy of a flood management strategy, which thinking that it is going to solve the, all the problems that occur as regards floods is concerned? And we have seen that it does not. And there are places where you know we have had problems. So in order to bring together a, or rather to initiate a conversation which normally is not uh, really entertained is talking about the typologies of floods. Who are the people exposed? And what is the character uh, characteristic of these hazards? Now, it is important to deal with the impact be the stakeholders or the people who are impacted, and also in terms of the characteristics of the of the, the particular hazard, because then only we will be able to even think about what are the problems and how are we going to solve it. And in my later part of my presentation, I'll, I'll when I'll be talking about the flash floods, it it it'll become evident as to why it I'm trying to talk about typologies. And may I uh, share here that you know when we started. Uh, in 2005, or rather when I started to work in Bihar in 2005, for me, floods was uh, a uniform identity. And it continued till about 2010. It was later when I revisited the work that we were doing, uh, and I realized that the impacts were different in different areas. And that was the triggering part for us to figure out that if flood happens to be a uniform entity, the problems are supposed to be the same, then why are we having different impacts in different regions? Taking for granted that, yes, I mean, taking into consideration that there are different kinds of people, population, different uh, groups of people, all of that. But then somehow we were trying to deal with basic necessities in terms of drinking water during floods and other uh, uh, drinking, uh, other water-related issues. But then the impacts were different. And that is when we realized that it is important for us to further investigate or delve in areas that we were working so that we have a better understanding. And that is when we started deciphering these different areas, different types of floods. And it was not very easy because uh, uh, when we talk about typologies of floods, at times people believe that you know we are kind of diluting the issue of floods by bringing in these different uh, uh, you know typologies. But on the contrary, we are actually strengthening the whole argument of floods by bringing these uh, diverse uh, floods because you know then we are trying to project and also propagate that you know there are different kinds of floods. Problems are very different. We need to have a, some different approach while we are addressing all, uh, while we are trying to address these uh, floods in different uh, in different landscapes. So, 
the reason why i am kind of uh, talking about flash floods here is because you know uh, bihar as i said earlier we have five big rivers uh, in 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 north bihar and these are intimidating rivers these are rivers which are famous for bringing in floods but also famous for helping people survive along uh, the entire co- the in, in their entire co- i mean along their course but then because of the size of these rivers they are always in uh, public domain they are always discussed they are always thought about but then if you look around if you look at this particular <clears throat> map which is gurdsi wrd government of bihar you'll see uh, in from the nepal side to india bihar side you'll see these blue lines now these are these small transboundary seasonal invisible rivers which tend to bring in floods which are basically flash floods and it is i i must say that you know the flash flood phenomena in bihar actually was we started talking about it was in 2017 and uh, thanks to the honorable chief minister of bihar who act, who said in 2017 i quote that it is that the floods in bihar in 2017 are not the normal river rain floods they are flash floods and it was then accepted as <clears throat> flash floods do occur and we need to look at it but then it was just for 2017 thereafter things have not really been different so when we talk about flash floods uh, the region which i want to highlight here is basically the border between nepal and bihar which is approximately 601 kilometers so there are there are different numbers so it's as, there are documents which claim 601 there are documents which claim 726 kilometers now there are um, the the uh, districts which are on uh, there are seven districts on bihar side <clears throat> which share border with nepal and similarly there are districts on nepal side as well and uh, these seven districts that we have in bihar side pashchim champaran purbi champaran sitamari madhubani sopol arari and kishanganj they have a trend of having floods and i'm not saying that all floods that occur in these seven districts are flash floods but there are probabilities that there are that they are flash floods just because of the fact that we have not really deciphered or we have not segregated the kind of floods that are happening is that we are unable to know and this i'll get i'll let you know that you know in the subsequent slide we'll get to know as to what exactly what i trying i'm trying to uh, mention here or the point that i'm trying to make here now uh, these rivers that come in from nepal to india are basically from the chure ranges and uh, it's basically chure and the shivalik ranges that they come in and they be bring in flash floods and uh, we have been uh, you know identifying different rivers across these small uh, across the uh, in, in the Nep- uh, nepal border across the seven districts and we have come across almost about uh, if i am not mistaken about 136 of these rivers and we are still counting now a lo- most of these rivers are seasonal small and invisible and they tend to bring in flash floods now the point here is that if we do not even know about these rivers if we do not have knowledge about these rivers if we do not know the characteristic of these rivers we do not know the dynamics then in in such a case dismissing floods as water logging normally tends to happen so it's a very thin line during uh, incess i mean you know uh, intense rainfall uh, along the terai region when the water comes into bihar it's easy to talk about that these are basically waterlogged areas rather than flash flood prone areas or flash flood affected areas and that's largely because of the fact that there are rivers that we don't even know and then we don't even you know consider as rivers now that is a problem because flash floods tend to be something which is recurring now i was talking about uh, you know the seven districts now if you look at this data and this is government of bihar's data from 20, 2000 to 
uh, most of the this um, most of the seven districts do feature in some way or the other in in the entire list and especially as i said 2017 was the time when we had the worst of flash floods in in bihar all the seven districts are men, are, are are there so the fact is that this data in itself should be pushing us to look into the fact that how many of these small rivers are there what has been the past trends of these small rivers and how frequently have they been bringing in flash floods in their respective areas so we, it was in 2016 uh, that we did a, a study for uh, nirdp uh, where we were trying to look at uh, you know moderate floods conditions and moderate floods we were very clear that we would not be looking into big river systems rather small river systems and we did it across three districts but here i'll be talking only about the ones that we i mean in pashchim champaran and uh, why we were doing this is basically to actually project what we have been talking about as far as flash flood is concerned the concept of flash flood is something which is important the concept and the occurrence of flash flood is something that we need to come out with unfortunately because of lack of uh, adequate study there are not much of data which specifically talks about flash floods so there are very in, uh, detailed um, you know um, reports that are covered by newspapers by online um, you know portals where they talk about flash floods somehow they are the only sources but there are no government documents which actually go into the details of flash floods keeping in mind the river the flow the occurrences etc and this study of ours actually helped us to look into it and uh, the fact was we wanted to do riverscaping and we wanted to understand the impact of flash floods in these areas and uh, this was for the first time that make pine abhyan was actually getting into this kind of a study so we it was we were also extremely new to uh, the the occurrence of flash floods and also in terms of you know trying to figure out as to what uh, what are the different tools that we need to adopt in order to you know interact with people to get the right questions so this was our initial uh, set of engagement with uh, uh, with floods and we did almost about three rivers one of the rivers that we did was called chegraha now chegraha the name in itself is very interesting chegraha means something which comes down and then it kind of splits chitragya in bihar we have this word of chitrana which it distributes it splits so that's how this name came in of this river chegraha now uh, and we did uh, the uh, and there were three uh, villages where we did uh, this study of but this particular uh, uh, seasonal river chegra now the, i mean basically to give uh, the viewers a, a kind of an idea as to where which part of uh, bihar we were trying to deal with so it's so uh, this is the map of bihar on the extreme right and uh, extreme left then the district and the particular river now when we were kind of un- trying to understand as to when all flash floods have occurred in this particular uh, river in this particular ri- uh, river or uh, when all this river has brought in flash floods from 2007 till 2016 we realized that apart from the month of february november and december there have been different times that this particular river has brought in floods flash floods to be specific and which in itself was an alarming uh, you know um, knowledge to attain from people then we tried to figure out as to how many in uh, in how many times in a year that this particular ri- uh, river has brought in floods and uh, we were actually shocked because of the fact that we could see that you know people were narrating that you know there were 60 times in 2016 that they had floods in one single year they were and the minimum was almost 35 a uh, 30 and the maximum one was 60 now these flash floods if you go back to the uh, definition of flash floods what we were trying to uh, I mean what they say is the flash flood occurs and it the impact is there for almost i mean the flash the water stays on for a couple of hours and then it recedes but then what happens during that period is that you know the impact of flash floods not only has impact on human lives but there are diverse impacts that we tend to 
you know, experience that people tend to experience there. And the difference here is in terms of the frequency. So a kind of an impact that you, you, you experience given the floods, flooding for the first time, and Im, Im, just imagine the kind of uh, impact it will be if the floods keep occurring in one calendar year. So this was, uh, you know, uh, this was again an area in a kind of a revolution for us as to how people have to actually survive, uh, you know, recurring floods and that too, which have a kind of an impact which unsettles them and pushes them to, towards poverty. So a few of the examples that we came up, I mean, that we, I mean, that I'm trying to highlight here is in terms of destruction of the stand, standing curry core crop. That entire belt is known as the sugarcane uh, belt of Bihar. The sugarcane uh, was something which, used, which often gets uh, destroyed. You have indebtedness, which actually uh, forces people to migrate. And of course, there are issues with regard to land erosion during floods. And now, when you're talking about land erosion and floods, this is not the riverine floods that we are talking about. We are talking about flash floods, which tend to impact the land on a frequent basis in one calendar year. So the difference between the riverine floods and the flash flood is basically in terms of the frequency, in terms of the impact, and in terms of a repeated occurrences. So when uh, it then we thought that you know it is important once we have got these details it is important basically to figure out as to how do we under understand flash floods what is it that it it will help us to figure out and also to throw out a kind of a template which needs to evolve when we are talking about flash floods these are our ex ex experiences these are the way in which we have understood flash floods maybe we have missed out on a lot of things and and there is a high probability of of it as well but then at least in order to initiate a dialogue on flash flood there has to be a kind of a framework so this is what we actually came out with in terms of what are the what are the ways in which we can attempt to understand flash floods which started off with the cycle normally the cycle of riverine uh, the, the flood cycle is seen is is considered to be the period during which the floods occur, but then the pre, during, and post cycle often they are they are missing from the entire, uh, you know, uh, from the entire discourse. So that is one thing which we thought was important, and more so because of the occurrence of the reoccurrences of flash floods in that particular region. Similarly, there were issues with in terms of linked themes. There were diverse stakeholders, and all of this actually helped us in bringing out a strong narrative in terms of flash floods and because of the fact that we did this study in 2016 2017 i think so it is still relevant when whenever we have to talk about flash floods because those learning somehow we have uh, we have not been able to translate it into uh, another study and that is what the requirement is at the moment of how uh, such studies can be taken up so that we get a larger picture in in in, in uh, and and then we develop the whole narrative on flash floods. Uh, again, the fact of when we were when we started talking about flash floods, it was all, all about uh, you know it was important for us to understand where the habitations are located, which what are the category of the rivers, what are the characteristic of the floods, and we have seen differences in flash floods as well, but we are not even venturing there. Because of the fact that, first of all, we need to get flash flood recognized as a typology of flood so that there are dedicated interventions, there are sensitive interventions and designs and plans for, for the, the landscape that receives this kind of, uh, I mean, this, this as such floods. So the question again comes back to us is, despite having all of these, why is it so that you know flash floods have have remained to be a, a lesser known disaster in Bihar? And I'm right right now talking about Bihar. I mean, if we take UP into consideration, if we take Assam into consideration, I think so. The similar questions are going to come up there as well as to how much importance, how much space have we given to flash floods when we are talking about you know floods as a whole. So, what the takeaways basically? is and this is again a road uh, what i am kind of sharing here is the roadmap 
that we traversed and we are still trying to develop it uh, uh, for uh, for our future course of action first is in in terms of sm identifying small seasonal and invisible rivers till the time we actually know as to what are the, what is the scale we are talking it's very difficult to even start a conversation whether it's be, be whether be it at the block level district level or state level so that is one thing which is is definitely required the second is in terms of the root of these small seasonal and in, invisible rivers because of the fact that it is not been um, you know looked into so it is a very challenging task but a very interesting task to walk along i mean we had my previous uh, speaker did mention about walking the entire ganga uh, uh, basin till uh, in in and all till up but here i am also talking about within the district within a block of walking a small stretch of uh, river which is basically small seasonal and invisible so that brings in other challenges uh, i think it is also interesting to bring this con concept of be befriending such uh, small seasonal and invisible rivers because unless and until we do that there is not going to be much of connection we are not going to understand the people people are not even if they and there is a lot of skepticism in terms of sharing their knowledge there is a lot of skepticism in terms of sharing the experiences because people are not sure whether we are comprehending the kind of problem they have been facing uh there was uh, this uh, in 2017 there was this uh, village called marjadi in in paschim champaran which had got entirely devastated because of a flash flood which stayed on to their village for just 2 hours and according to people they said if the if the river if the water would have stayed for another half an hour none of us would have been alive it was a very good st uh, story that uh, nidhi jamwal had done on this particular uh, uh, village now the fact is that if you do if you are not able to understand why did the people say that for half an hour of the river would have stayed in their village people would have died now the concept of a unified or a uniform flood vis-a-vis -vis the floods which have occurred in marjadi unless until you understand this whole the difference it's not there's no way that we are going to even create a dent or make a dent in the kind of problems that they are facing uh what we have real what we realized uh, was that people's narrative in the absence of any data was the most formidable uh, source to develop our own understanding and perspective with i mean you know uh, going to a village and when we are talking about floods about something which there is no reference to and we can get into the details as to why uh, why they are not considered to be floods at all at times by flash it is difficult for flash floods to be termed as floods so those are the other uh, details but right now i won't get into it and it's also about i mean i as far and specifically uh, because i am kind of uh, uh, talking to the students here i think so there is a lot of commonality between such small seasonal and invisible rivers and students this concept in itself is so fascinating that you know students should look into this aspect where they can explore such rivers because there is a lot of commonality and they would find it exciting to know more about such uh, you know rivers that bring in flash floods so basically again building from what we did was actually looking at what are the i mean what are the gaps that are there and it's not about fault finding the fact is that if you if you are not able to identify the gaps there is no way that we are going to even talk about what needs to be done and there are plenty and i say plenty again because of the fact that flash floods are not there in the discourse at all and even if they are there they are there merely from the perspective of being talked about the detailing of a riverine flooding the transboundariness of a uh, of a big river vis vis a vis the trans transboundariness of a small seasonal invisible river is something which is i mean we have not even touched upon we have been hovering we have been moving around these larger river systems but there is nothing that has been done with regard to these small seasonal and transboundary i mean small seasonal and invisible rivers which are also transboundary in character so 
basically uh, the other idea that we had or what we were talking about is it is important for us to recognize and engage with the diversity as they have the potential to influence cooperation here we are totally for uniformity so there's a uniform floods the whole concept of uniform floods is something which is not going to help us in any which way to develop cooperation because and there is there won't be a collective action in that when the problems in, in itself are so diverse so different there is no way that you know we can use a unified a uh, concept or or a visual of floods and try to address all the problems and even if you want to do that it will be catastrophic and also the fact is somehow uh when it comes to these small rivers the risks first of all they we don't know about them even if we know then the risks involved in along these small rivers are less studied so there is a huge potential that you know we need to look into and otherwise what happens that we come up with solutions which have nothing to do with the locations that there is we are totally off the context but we are adamant that there are the, the, the problems are getting solved we do not have the enthusiasm or the sincerity to reflect on our own action and to say that there is there is a change that is required and uh it was very interesting to hear what the previous speaker had to say that you know uh, the interventions how they help i mean the interventions by the development agencies and all and uh, it was nice to see a different perspective of it and for us the way we have been looking at the these areas which are which uh, you know have up to the problem of uh, uh, uh small i mean uh, these flash floods is basically that there has to be an attempt to talk about flood resilient habitat and i'm not and when i talk about habitat it's just not about houses that i'm talking about i'm i'm also talking about the entire gamut of uh, the uh, habitation that is required for for survival that is what is required there but how many times have i mean where all have we actually tried this and tried again not with a very uniform approach it's about for an area where we have tried the uh, in areas which have which are flash flood prone areas areas which are riverine flood prone areas areas where you have uh, riverine floods within embankments outside embankments is this concept of a flood resilient habitat really gaining ground and it is not that this the 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 state or the center they do not have funds for such kind of a program because there is already ongoing program there is a lot of convergence that we are talking about here in order to make frh a, a kind of a reality the other thing is also there have been innovations at our end make pine abhyan has been extensively working on uh, on sanitation and drinking water and uh, the reason why the name make pine abhyan came in is it was basically cloud water campaign and we started off with this whole campaign by popularizing temporary rainwater harvesting in areas that were affected by floods and later on we moved on to looking at what are the ways in which we can ensure access to sanitation throughout the year in areas which are flood prone and again different designs for uh, you know areas that are affected by flash floods different design for areas that are affected by riverine floods so i think so i'll end here in terms of to begin with there is there has to be a beginning and i think so the beginning has to be by in actually disseminating understanding and disseminating information about flash floods that is one stream that needs to be pursued our our approach has to be that we create a credible space for flash floods in our policies and practices uh there is a huge scope of undertaking risk anal flood risk analysis flash flood risk, um, risk analysis and mapping in areas where these uh, these uh, flash floods are uh, prominent they occur and most importantly there has to be a participatory and indisciplinary uh, disciplinary study on small and seasonal transboundary rivers that is 
again uh, and this is this could be a possible place where we could have universities getting interested we could you could have students getting interested to come and explore the uh, you know the the possibilities of engaging with something which has not been done in greater detail and i would end by uh, quoting gorak pande which basically is, is he hints on the whole fact of that invisibility is an enabling tool for denial and we have seen that very clearly when it comes to uh, flash floods uh, in north bihar thank you yeah thank you so much eklavya for your uh, uh, interesting and insightful uh, presentation which basically uh, it makes us also think that you know we also believe that all floods are the same but uh, the argument that you make very strongly is putting forth is that you know floods are not, not one flood is the same as the one and the other and we should not be treating them like that uh, we are running short of time but in the interest of whatever little that we have left i just wanted to quickly come to you for one important question and since you have been there uh, studying about these floods and these patterns that are there in uh, bihar uh, have you seen any shift happening in terms of you know the climate change over the past years has has these kind of events uh, flash floods and etc been you know becoming more frequent and what do you think is going to be the you know projection going forth in the years ahead ah shashwa that's a very important question because um, if you look at flash floods they are actually triggered because of uh, uh, continuous intense incessant rainfall and uh, they they that is basically the triggering point now if i have to revisit the past to answer your question i would begin by saying that you know initially um, uh, a couple of years back our floods used to happen flooding season in bihar is normally july end august beginning whether it's riverine floods or whether it's flash floods as as a template now we get to know that flash flash floods keep occurring all through the year barring 3 months now uh, in the recent past 2017 we had floods flash floods there in bihar which was again during july uh, Ju july and august period in 2021 in 2020 we had floods which occurred in the month of july and last year the first round of floods in pashchim champaran was in june now a lot many people would say that these 3 years taking into consideration these 3 years and answering a question in terms of climate change is a big mistake but agreed but there is a trend which we are we are seeing this year bihar did not receive any floods till september flooding happened in the month of october so there is a change that we are seeing and mind you i mean uh, whether we are in a flash flood prone area or we are in a riverine flood flood, uh, flood prone area we need to believe we need to realize that kharif happens to be the main crop and kharif is the most vulnerable and people get into kharif because of free irrigation to a large extent now if this shift if the monsoon tends to start shifting like uh, what we are seeing it it does bring a possibility of a very a scary future whether it's more in terms of abundance or whether it's in terms of scarcity so that balance is not going to be there and there are basically certain projections that we are facing so in 2017 there was a part of pashchim champaran district which was almost going to be uh, you know declared as drought affected and the remaining parts and, and, and a substantive part of the district was flood prone and flood affected so definitely there are uh, uh, um, there are these indicators which are kind of pointing towards a catastrophic future when we bring in climate change but then i need to also bring in another aspect here of climate change and which is that somehow whether it's i mean a lo lot to do with urban flooding that at times we use climate change as a very uh, easy escape route to put the entire burden and the responsibility of flooding on on climate change 
So we need to be slightly wary of that as well, as to when uh, climate change is being used and how it is being used to push and to articulate the flooding uh, occurrence. Just one final take. Uh, you know, the reports that uh, that the famous reports that now talk about have moved from a status of more of mitigation to adaptation, right? Yeah. How do you adapt really. to a scenario where you, how do the people, the masses of people, and you won't have uh, the, the social uh, strata of the people living on horrible. the side of these banks is very, you know, it's not very. How would they be able to adapt to a changing scenario like that? And what sort of you know, uh, kind of perils they will face when, when these kind of problems exacerbate? Shashwat, sorry, could you just repeat the question because there was some disturbance. I couldn't figure out what. So I'm talk talking about as we move from a more of a you know uh, mitigation to adaptation kind of thing. Is there is is there any how do we adapt to some a scenario where uh, you know flash floods are becoming more common and you have different sort of uh, flooding patterns that you're talking about? What can uh, or what should be the you know larger administrative setup being uh, you know uh, action being taken to just. You know, Look, to begin with, again, I might sound uh, repetitive, but it is important to mention it here, given the uh, space that I've got to talk about flash floods. First of all, it is extremely important to bring in flash flood as a, as a real phenomenon. We need to prioritize its occurrence. That's one. Second thing is that uh, as... Uh, Jayanta Da in his initial uh, uh, in his presentation did touch upon the fact that there is a very limited, you know, uh, articulation of a river, and even if it is, it is from a very specific perspective. I bring that perspective here as again. When we talk about adaptation, when we talk about mitigation, it is from a very structural perspective. The whole non-structural perspective is missing. And even within the non-structural, there is this whole effort to bring it to a kind of a discourse which is too technical and yet non-structural. Now, in reverse, I mean, for us to understand what adaptation is, we actually need to go and talk to the people who have been staying there since eons. Now, if, I, if we say this, this doesn't sound very fashionable. It sounds like, you know, this is a run of a mill kind of an approach. And we are not going to, e I mean, how can people tell us about what, what adaptation is when we actually know what adaptation is? So there is a kind of a, a con cultural context to the kind of engagement that we are doing with regard to understanding of the adaptation measures and how we should further decentralize it. Now, the, the reason why a lot, there is a group that is scared of decentralization is because the narratives that are going to get, that will emerge will be difficult for them to handle. So again, we bring in this whole idea of why floods is a uniform entity. The third thing is, again, if you look at the district level, we have the district disaster management plan, plan or we have the district, say, say the flood management plan. To what extent have we decentralized it? And to what extent have we captured the diversity? I would not name, I would not mention the name of the district, but there was a flash flood recently in that district. And the district, uh, uh, the DM, actually came on record to say that it is it is not uh, flash flood, it is water logging. And there was no counter because of the fact that that narrative is not there. That particular district has not been divided in terms of these are the areas which are vulnerable during flash floods. So you see, it is then it becomes, when we talk about adaptation, then adaptation gets defined at a particular space which just gets rolled into these different areas which are affected. The real adaptation is, is has to be bottoms up, but that's not happening. So uh, when we talk about adaptation, we have to be very, uh, we have to be sensitive and we have to be very careful 
as to which adaptation are we trying to look into. And yes, uh, the way people used to adapt to floods, whether it was riverine floods in different locations or flash floods in different locations, things have changed. Now, even they are finding it difficult to adapt because the character of floods have changed. So, yes, there has to be a convergence in terms of the experiences of those people who have been staying in these areas since a long time and they have been surviving floods and also the new measures that can bring relief to them. Relief in terms of not relief, relief, but relief in terms of address their problems. That is how I would look into adaptation rather than dictating adaptation to them. I, I kind of, uh, yeah, it's a discussion that I'm sure we can, we can, it's a passionate discussion that we can take on for a long term, uh, long time and which we are, uh, you know, solely running short of. So without much ado, uh, Jayantada, I'd like to uh, bring you back onto this thing to kind of summarize the discussion point as, as you, as you have your monograph on the water tables of, you know, the water towers of Asia has been kind of a, precursor to this whole conversation that we are having today it, it does more justice to just have you give us a kind of a you know your thoughts share your thoughts on different aspects that were raised today yeah thanks Shashwat. uh we had two extremely interesting uh, presentations uh and tony and uh, may i call you tony or what is uh, the way uh, it's tony on online and tony Sure, Anthony, Tony, both are fine. Thanks. Ah, okay. And and uh, Ekalavya. Uh, for for many of the standard uh, thinkers on the Ganga, Tony's work appears to be uh, quite a bit of uh, away from the standard. And uh, I think the whole issue of the colonial impact on cartography <clears throat> is extremely important for us to understand that cartography is not uh, only from the survey of India, but individuals are also cartographers. There could be people's cartographers. And uh, I give full credit to the survey of India people, Reynolds map, uh, which stands out as a fantastic proof of Brahmaputra and Ganga not meeting each other and going to Bay of Bengal separately. Uh, Reynolds, uh, one of the maps, Reynolds had so many other maps. But uh, he puts forward this whole issue of non-standard understanding of environment, of rivers, of water flows, uh, which is extremely uh, the interesting to be recorded and I look forward to even reading the book. I have not yet. So I, I think that's something uh, very, very important for all of us to be aware of. And going back to the monograph on uh, the water towers of Asia, in fact, one of the knowledge element that we have proposed is that of stakeholders. Stakeholders do not have the standard, as I mentioned, understanding of social sciences or natural sciences, but they have their own understanding of nature. And uh, it is important to uh, record, to understand, recognize, and put in policy debate and policy formulation, the knowledge of the stakeholders. Uh, it is a very emerging topic for us. And uh, probably uh, the, the, the book will be of great use in future design of research. Now, regarding Ekelebe's, sorry, it is a, a uh, topic which has been addressed by many, unlike uh, Tony, Eklabas topic has been designed by many. And I think uh, uh, a, a, what, what again, I, I go back to the monograph, 
that atmosphere and the hydrosphere have to be linked. Much of the concept of flood, flood control, flood identification, flood characterization is dominated by a very reductionist engineering approach of surface flows. But before the surface flow comes, we have to have the whole idea of precipitation, the atmospheric circulation, their interaction with themselves as well as with the landmass. And I, I see the clarification between or, or characterization of the standard floods and flash floods uh, can be made if easier to understand if we go to the upward linkage with the atmosphere. Because uh, there is something called anomalous precipitation. And anomalous precipitation occurs during gaps in monsoon. And these anomalous precipitations are not of the standard monsoon types, 150 millimeters per day, at the most 200 millimeters per day. They are 400 millimeters per day. The, 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 each of these flash floods uh, have behind them a very anomalous precipitation. So flash floods should not be purely characterized by surface flows, but it has to be characterized by atmospheric preparation of precipitation to cause that surface flow. And in any future research, please keep it in mind that you have to have the linkage with the atmosphere. And there are spots where the various atmospheric currents, one such spot is above Brahmaputra's origin, the, the three rivers of Luhit, the uh, and, and the two others before we go to Subansiri, the I, I remember, do not call, recall the two names. That in the origin of Brahmaputra, in the upper catchment, there is a uh, strong uh, statistical probability of anomalous precipitation. I remember the names: Dibang and Dihang. The Luhit, Dihang, and to the west of that is Dibang. To the west of Dibang is Suban City. These four rivers are, and their gorges, are such that circulations interact intensely to create anomalous precipitation, 400 millimeters per, per 24 hours, or 100 millimeters in one hour, like that. And these are the roots of what you are calling the flash floods. When we have the monsoon current, standard monsoon current, not anomalous, they have 100, 150 millimeters of rainfall, which you call the normal floods. So uh, floods itself are not well understood. And uh, these are the things, the ecological backward linkage of the floods will probably give you a lot of new understanding. and. That is another point I have been stressing in this monograph. But on the whole, both the presentations are extremely thought-provoking, interesting. And uh, I uh, congratulate both my colleagues for uh, making this very important contribution. Shashwat. Thank you, Jayantida, for you know, kind of uh, doing that. I, I would also like to thank you for, you know, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us, sparing your time and being with us all through this thing. You know, uh, you are joining from Calcutta, uh, Eklavya who is joining from Dhanbad, and Anthony who has, who has you know, skipped on his sleep just to be with us and talk about his whole journey as he was a, you know, as he was like a Spider-Man walking across the shores of Dhanbad. So that, that, that kind of image will stay with me for a long time. But on a, on a broad level, I would just say one of the things that stood out as we spoke about the whole river and the genesis from the towers, uh, you know, water towers of Asia, the Hindu Kush mountains to uh, think you know, one line kind of stands with me and it kind of resonates also with the festival that we are having. You know, you the line that Jantada used was you cannot uh, protect rivers of life 
while you're degrading the life of rivers. So I think so that's a beautiful uh, statement that that kind of, uh, you know, resonates very strongly with that. You know, while we talk about rivers as, as you know, kind of sacred, we talk about rivers as, uh, you know, ecological, economical aspects, we also have to kind of, uh, you know, bear in mind that rivers also have their own right to, you know, flow. They also have their own individual right which they also need to they they are they are an entity by themselves in that sense so without uh with that uh note i'd like to thank again jandada eklavya anthony again and uh, it has been a very interesting uh discussion insightful for all of us uh i'm sure i would the rest of the viewers and those who are watching us at the campus I, the, I'm sure there's a very interesting River Diaries event that would be waiting a musical event and lo loads of things coming up over the next uh, couple of days. So thank you again till we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.